Welcome to Crimson Guitars, welcome to my home studio, welcome to, welcome to the final episode of this build. This is a baritone semi-hollow instrument that I built. Uh, we started it on a live stream build and uh, I'm ending it up here. It was, it was built to help raise money for the uh, British Red Cross Ukraine appeal and uh, we raised over £15,000. Uh, but at this point, at this point, I need to finish it, and the lucky so and so who won the raffle will, uh, well, we'll get an instrument. Burn it. Perfect! <laughs> Back in the workshop, it's been a couple of weeks of shows and guitar shows and Maker Central and uh, uh, a lot of insanity, but. While that was all going on, in the back of my mind, I wasn't very happy with this guitar. I really, really like this upper half. This here, it just feels too round. It, I honestly think it should have been a little bit more offset. We've got a beautiful thinness, more narrowness there, and that looks just a little bit fat and chunky. And what I want to do, bearing in mind we've got a control cavity at the back, now, option number one is it goes like that and there's a little bit fatter, or option two goes up that way. <laughs> Just need to get rid of that. And that's not an issue. That is much better. Yes, yeah, seriously, seriously, I'm much happier with that. Uh, to the Santa. I'm going to do the bulk of the sanding back at headquarters, where it's quicker. This ripwood is so soft. Hey. If, if I hadn't pulled back, I would have gone halfway through the, the body there. Crikey. This section of neck here is uh, raised up above the body. I need to get rid of that and I'm going to use, I'm going to use a cranked chisel, perfect for this task. So you want to go from one side to the middle, from the other side to the middle. If I pull, push too hard across here, some of the neck would might chip out beneath the level of the top. Fred slot cleaning saw. Even. Wow, this is pretty much perfect for this task. Nice. All the body. Gives everywhere. That's just a round over. Inside ground gouge. The bevel's on the uh, inside of the curve. Very, very useful. All right, so switches or controls, even when they're not in a straight line, you do want them to be uh, the same distance apart if at all possible. All right, we drill through with a small bit from this side. It might be a little bit of tear out. And the switch needs a 12 millimeter hole. Ah. 
I'd forgotten about this hardware. There's too many projects going on. This is exciting to me. So we're at uh, 11, nearly 11 and a half. So an 11 mil hole should do. Let's find the position. All right. So I'll line up the ruler where the nut is going to be, but also where that string will be. And then it runs along to the saddle and should be in the center of the saddle. Do that on both sides, allowing a little bit more room on the edge for the base string and you'll be all right. This video is sponsored by Skillshare and I am intensely grateful to be working with such a cool company. I am all about learning. I am all about consistently learning and upping my skills. I believe in diversity. I believe that if I learn something from a blacksmith or from a watchmaker, it can then be applied in my guitar building, whether it is an actual technique or a look. Just the fact that I know that certain things are possible because I've seen other craftspeople doing it in their medium means that my making is better. This also works with regards to, for example, web design. On Skillshare, they've got classes on logo design and web design and marketing through to self-help and self-health. I'm at the moment going through a blacksmithing class with Ron Payne. Blacksmith Beginnings, lesson one. On YouTube, we watch so many people. Alex Steele, for example, phenomenally talented, disgustingly talented. And we'll watch them do this amazing thing. But watching that is more edutainment than education because at the moment, most of what he's putting out is really high end, really high quality, really high difficulty. On Skillshare, I'm going here and saying, okay, please take me right back to the basic basics. I understand a lot of this, but step one. Show me step one. No ads, no interruptions. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. I am a fan. You should check it out. The first 1,000 people to use the link or my code Crimson Guitars will get a one month free trial of Skillshare to help explore your creativity. Before I do anything, some masking tape just to set the position. I don't want this to move at all. There we go, that should do. With the bridge in place, I take a center point bit that fits and use that to mark my position, bang in the center. Just in case, double check with some calipers, or better yet, look at the uh, specs of the bridge. And there we are, let's pull on. We need a depth stop, or at least we need to know how deep to drill, and I don't want to put masking tape. It's the one thing I don't use masking tape for, unless I can help it. Uh, I would rather use a permanent marker and mark it on the drill bit itself. Uh, funnily enough, this drill bit has already got a marker in the exact correct place. The reason for that is that masking tape uh, gets moved sometimes by the chips and the shavings. You, you could sort of follow it all the way through the guitar. So play it safe where possible. I am also going to be drilling this by hand. I don't use pillar drills very much at all. I, I just don't. I'm very good at drilling straight, especially with a big drill bit like this. Uh, plop it on the hole and gently start. And that first cut, as it hits the as it hits the top, that first cut, if the circle is immediately complete, then you're going down straight and true and just keep on going. Simple. If you're not comfortable with that, a pillar drill, a pillar drill is your friend. And then use the depth stop part of your calipers to double check. I'm perfectly deep enough, so I'm going to go a mil or two longer just in case. Perfect. There we go. Now the other thing to do is drill a bridge ground and I want to go from this hole all the way straight into the control cavity. Always start with a 
mark and a nice long drill bit. Oodles of confidence that you're going in the correct direction. Now once finish is applied, I might have to actually drill these out a little bit more. With that in mind, I want to bevel the countersink. And this uh, allows a not sharp edge for the finish to adhere to. And it's going to be less likely to chip out when I drill this cavity. And of course I should have left masking tape on. And that's lined up very nicely. And same thing, I'm just going to line the ruler up along the edge of the pickups, see where it hits on the tailpiece. <laughs> Try not to hit it and move it. Matches in the same sort of place. That's on the center line. We're good. And we want it to be straight, so measure from the pickup cavity edge 56 and a quarter, 56 and a quarter ish. There we go. Out there is that. Same again. Hmm. Now my permanent marker has actually come off that. So just quickly reapply that. Just a little bit of candle wax on a little warm drill bit or beeswax, something like that. Hopefully that's quick and will stop now. Thank you, Mr. Crow. And my ears appreciate that. And that there is that. Uh, side. Oh, Jack. Jack's up. Talking. Forgotten how. Forgive. Line the jack socket up with that there. We're using a barrel jack because I don't have a, a brushed standard jack. And this in that position only just comes through to here. Now I could chisel away or gouge away some excess that side or recess that deeper into the body so it comes through or maybe even a combination of the both. 12 mil hold it is. I, I enjoy drilling holes in uh, uh, in guitars. It's it's a uh, thing. Sorry. Let's try a spoon carving gouge. And finally, just a chisel. There we go. Now I could do this with a with a Dremel and a carving thing and that might actually look a little bit smoother. I'll tidy up with that. My first instinct is always to go for a chisel or a plane. It's a weakness. It's actually much easier. There we go. Perfect. We're done. At this stage, we're going to move post haste to to Crimson headquarters. Uh, the guitar, uh, the baritone is going to be sanded down, and oh, I'll run it over the router table. You don't need to see that. There's a, a bit of ram over on the on the back here. Uh, sand it, finish, finish, and uh, I will meet you next in the spray booth of doom. That makes it sound like the spraying is going to go wrong. Uh, the spray booth of awesomeness. No, no, it's not. Okay, uh, piece of ebony. I need to create an ebony backplate uh, to go in there. So uh, just gonna plain glue, and then we'll move on to the next stage.
This saw is total overkill. <laughs> Shooting board. Okay. So I obviously wasn't planning quite square. <laughs> that is basically invisible. That's going to be a good one. Glue, clamp, done. Now when you're gluing two surfaces like that together, rub them, rub them together like this. That both spreads the glue, spooges it everywhere that you don't want it to go, and uh, makes for a better joint. Lined up. Nice, nothing's moved. I'm going to wipe away the excess with tissue and we'll be done. Move on. Move on next time. Today I need to do a little bit of routing. I need to finalize uh, the curve where I changed that shape. I need to take this template and instead of using the oscillating spindle sander as I normally would to, to fit a back plate, I'm going to take this and uh, use the router table. Turn the router off and remove the, uh, the lock, the death stop. That allows you to put it all the way through. It locks off. The router now can't turn on. And then you lower it down again. This releases the uh, power button. And uh, you're good to go. Let's just set the height. That'll do. All of that just for this small area here. All right, we're good. So, Ebony, a good scraper is one of the most joyous tools to use. I absolutely love it. I've now got one side that is nice and flat. I'm not worried about the other. That will come out in the wash. That will be sanded flush uh, when we get to sanding the guitar later. For now, I needed a good surface onto which to use the masking tape and super glue trick to adhere the template. But yeah, don't glue the template down before you cut away the bulk of the excess on the bandsaw. Thus, if I sneeze and slip, uh, I'm not gonna run the risk of damaging my template. With the masking tape perfectly lined up, burnish it down and make sure you use uh, standard white masking tape with this, the shiny blue stuff. Uh, the super glue does not like to stick. This is a beautiful replacement for uh, finicky and annoying double-sided tape when done properly. Accelerator on one side, thin line of glue on the other and uh, attach. Get rid of the excess. And I've now got a very small amount of ebony to remove on the router using a, a bearing cutter. And uh, yeah, it'll be nice and nice and clean. Double bearing, three flute. And I'm gonna be working off the top bearing as much as I can. Keep it away from my fingers. Let's see how that goes. So that is, <laughs> that's a single bit of the masking tape and super glue trick. And it's, <clears throat> gonna take a little bit of effort to remove. There we go. No mess, no fuss, no detritus, no issues. But 
you all heard me describe this many times before. Okay, this is going to be, it's going to require a little bit of tidying up. Uh, I could have gone slower around the router cutter, uh, but uh, yeah. A little bit of that, we're good. Timber back plates are attractive. I've got no problem with that. Timber back plates, while using magnets to hold them in, super attractive, but also potentially, potentially difficult. Wood likes to move, and if it's not mechanically held in with bolts or screws, uh, or particularly stable like this ebony, you might have an issue with the magnets not being strong enough. And uh, if you did have magnets that were strong enough, you might potentially have an issue uh, with those magnets messing up with uh, your guitar. You can see what I'm dealing with here. Just a little bit of uh, rippling. Generally, you want to leave a relatively meaty gap. You don't want the, uh, the back plate to expand and to irre irrevocably, irrevocably become wedged in place. Uh, but uh, yeah, for now, that'll do. Let's go and uh, put that through a sand and thickness. Uh, sand. Get in the spray booth. With all of that done, it is time to go to headquarters where uh, I'm probably going to delegate the sanding to somebody else because because I, I can and I want to. Uh, but then we're going to go into the spray booth and uh, I'm going to hit it with a, uh, a two-pack flash coat that will allow me relatively rapidly to get back onto the build. I am going to do an intense fret job. I am going to be rounding the ends off and uh, level crown polish, all of that jazz, putting the hardware in place, uh, wiring her up, looking at these incredible pickups from uh, House of Tone. Matt is a genius. And well, we'll hear the instrument. Back from Crimson Guitars, this is a medium gloss, uh, one and done coat of uh, a 2k finish that we use we we use this a lot with our students uh, if you're coming down to crimson guitars to spend uh five or six days uh, building a guitar you don't have time to wait for the multi-day process of uh, a, a traditional high gloss lacquer or even the multi-day process of a hand applied oil if you want to get a, a really nice finish there so well there we go this is this is what we use it's cured ready to go within about half an hour. Uh, now the only issue is spraying this into a glued neck, a set neck instrument, uh, it sometimes struggles to get into the corners. Uh, so I'm going to be applying just a little bit of Renaissance wax um, in there. And yeah, what do you think? What do you think? Don't forget that you should be coming on a course at Crimson as well. We were recently at the uh, great, at, at the British Guitar Show. Uh, the UK Guitar Show, what do they call it? It's a big guitar show up in Birmingham. And I was blown away by Rosie at Turnstone Guitars. Uh, her, her instruments are always incredible. She builds steel string acoustic guitars, they're fantastic. Her fretwork on this particular instrument 
inspired and shamed me in equal measures. In this video, I'm going to try and see if I can up my own game. I've built hundreds of guitars, and that means nothing. There is always an improvement to be made. And if there isn't, if there wasn't, life would be boring. Let's protect the guitar itself first. And I'm going to be using a Crimson Guitars Frick leavening file. Leveling beam, 240 grit. I'm just uh, polishing the edges of the frets at this point, making life easier for me later on. Of course, you do want to avoid drawing on the fretboard itself with your permanent marker. It's not the uh, end of the world, but it would be somewhat annoying. Now, being a baritone, the scale length is wrong for the not straight edges. So I'll use the longer scale length and put it over the second fret. I will still be able to read most of the, of the neck. In fact, this is, this, is, this is perfectly flat. Fretboard protector, and with a traditional triangular crowning file, I'm not rounding things over at this point. I'll do that later in the polishing. Now these frets are uh, Evo Gold, they're hypoallergenic, they're uh, bronze, I suppose, actually, and uh, they're very hard. Not quite as hard as stainless steel, I don't think, uh, but very hard and harder to work. So there's a little bit more work involved, probably another 15, 20% of the time. Uh, but uh, Crimson Tools are perfectly capable of dealing with these and stainless. And, yeah, it's that fine. So essentially, if, if this fret is high, it'll rock, or if that fret is low, it'll rock. And then by going on to the next one, you'll see which of the two issues you've got. Perfect. And so we've got the flat side there, and then you round it over. The next stage, I've got a, a great big record power uh, RSBG6, six inch grinder. You will see that uh, I am buffing the frets from the center of the fretboard to the edge. Uh, this is both to reduce the risk of ripping the masking tape off and it also reduces the risk of me pulling the guitar out of my hand. Move on to the fretboard. We just need to uh, use the Crimson Fretboard Cleaner and then the Crimson Restorative. I'm going to uh, wipe off the excess now. And this is a well, well moisturized fretboard now. It's nice and clean. The frets are nice and shiny. I could not be happier. Today I'm gonna to be painting in the uh, uh, shielding paint. I'm going to be installing electronics. I'm going to be installing pickups and hardware and tuners, making a nut and playing this guitar for the first time. Let's go. I've got the, the back plate here. It's a solid piece of ebony and that has been sprayed. But before I sent it to the spray booth, I completely forgot to drill uh, screw holes or figure out uh, battery covers or uh, battery covers figure out <laughs> magnets uh, now even though it is stable and ebony I don't want this to uh, be held in with magnets it's uh, at some point it might it might well move 
So I'm just going to screw this down and be done with it. So uh, before I do anything, I have to drill those holes, don't I? Now this back plate is a little bit glossy and I want to, uh, I'm going to rub that down a little bit uh, in a bit. Uh, but before I get there, let's drill these and uh, see what we've got. So. Crimson's rear guard shielding paint. This one appears to be a little bit dehydrated. Oh no, that's all right. So at this stage, we've got uh, a section of recessed bit in the uh, in the guitar that does not have shielding paint on, and I want to paint shielding paint on the back of the uh, the back plate here, and also in there so that when we close it we've got a complete Faraday cage. So this is just a, a gentle task. And there we go, that should uh, that should do nicely. Here's what we're going to do, I'm going to start on the nut so I'm going to flip the guitar over. It is still wet in there. It's still a little bit damp in there, but uh, flip the guitar over and I'm going to use a scalpel to mark out exactly where I want to cut. And then I can turn the guitar back over on its belly. Unlike what I normally do, the nut cavity is actually not square, not quite. So I need to remove the excess here. The best way to cut bone, or at least a, a, a cured and hard bone nut, is a, uh, a metal cutting hacksaw. Like butter. Okay, so that shielding paint is pretty much cured now. I'm no longer worried about drips coming, uh, going to places where they're not supposed to. And now it is a case of carefully fitting the nut to the available space. Okay, pretty much there onto a leveling beam with a relatively coarse paper on it. Okay, at this stage I need to cut the nut down to the height. I fit it perfectly to the to the fretboard, uh, but I need to cut it down to the right uh, the right dimension. And I'm looking for a pencil that's been cut in half. But essentially, that's what you're after: a half pencil with the lead flat on the bottom. And this allows me to run a pencil on the top of the frets. That score line, that pencil line, will tell me the lowest point that I want each nut slot to be at. So I want my nut to be a little bit taller. There we go. Remove all of that. I'm rather impressed with uh, how that turned out. Okay, to the vise. That'll do. There we go. That is much nicer. 
small drop. And be done with that. Before we put the tuners on, I'm gonna get the guitar flat down on the bench and I'm gonna install the ground wire and some, uh, and the, uh, let's start getting on with this hardware, shall we? <laughs> yeah. So this is the Goto um, 510FA Tunematic style bridge with the uh, X chrome finish, which uh, is beautiful stuff. It looks like sterling silver and makes me very happy. Take the inserts or take the bridge posts out of the inserts before you do anything. This is a, a nicely buffed and shiny hammer. It should do little damage to the top. I am not taking it flush right down to the top. It's uh, about half a millimeter high. Isn't that an amazing finish? Just, just delicious. There's grub screws on both sides. So you've got some forward and back movement. You've got height adjustment, of course. Let's make sure we've got the uh, scale length spot on, shall we? Okay, we're quite high as well. Let's take that down, shall we? Okay. I wanna put the tuners on before I get to pickups, etc. I really like the silvery look that we get with these. Uh, I think they are incredibly attractive. I'm sort of regretting the fact that this isn't uh, my guitar. Onto a nut cube, again, available through crimsonguitars.com. I think that's it. There we go. Stunning. So what we've got here is uh, a few pieces of hardware that I just found in my drawers that I'd made years ago. Uh, the, uh, the control knobs are a set of, uh, of aluminium knobs that I made in one of my first workshops uh, in Henstridge, must be 15 years ago now. And so I've got those and I've got this uh, uh, truss rod cover. I don't have any more screws that have got the same finish. I do have some tiny magnets. There we go. Tiny hammer. Actually, this is a nice little brass hammer. Okay. Uh, so what you saw there was that I've got a little pile of uh, magnets and I put them all in, in one shot, uh, so that the polarity is the same on all three. Uh, once this is cured, uh, we can then go on to the next stage. There's a bit of glue. But back to the uh, wondrous thing that is a leveling beam. And we can get rid of that quite easily. At this stage, I've got three tiny magnets on the inside face of my truss rod cover. I need to take the rest of the magnets that I've got left and install one on the outside of each of those. 
I now have something that will easily mark on the headstock. A couple of pieces of masking tape, gently applied. I'm not burnishing this down. That's what the magnets are gonna do. Make sure I'm lined up where I'm supposed to be and push down where the three magnets are. Now I've now got three perfect marks where those are gonna be. We can mark where we need to drill and it's easy and supremely accurate. And I can feel that they're all in place. Should have done this before finishing and all of that happened because uh, this next bit, if I'm gonna super glue them in place, it can be quite dangerous. My initial thought is making sure that I keep the polarity correct. You just flip that over, push them in, and then apply some thin super glue after that fact. Thin super glue gets everywhere. Not good. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, spooge a small amount of super glue, just a drop of it, onto the masking tape here. And then using the cocktail stick, I'm gonna apply a drop inside each of those holes. There we go. There we go. All the magnets are now installed. They are where I need them to be, but they're also the correct polarity. I'm just gonna wipe away the excess super glue. I think we can call that a success, don't you? There are a few things more annoying than uh, going through all of this process and then realizing that one of your six magnets is pushing rather than attracting. Uh, it's just, it's just sad. Ta-da!